without saying that anatomy and surgery go hand in hand. When performing surgery, vets need a detailed understanding of anatomy to safely make their surgical approach and to perform the required corrective procedure with minimal impact on normal tissues and organs. Orthopaedic surgery brings with it some additional considerations. To explore these and much more, I talked to specialist surgeon Dr. Michelle Joffe. Welcome to Veterinary Anatomy in Practice. I'm Karina, and joining me today is Dr. Michelle Joffe, a specialist surgeon with a particular interest in orthopaedic and spinal surgery. Michelle completed her vet degree, internship and surgical residency at the University of Sydney before obtaining her specialist qualification as a diplomat of the European College of Veterinary Surgeons. I'm really grateful that Michelle has found time in her demanding clinical schedule at the Veterinary Specialists of Sydney to join us today, particularly after performing an operation late last night. Thank you and welcome, Michelle. Thanks for having me on. So, as an experienced practitioner, could you describe for us your generally your relationship with anatomy? How does it serve you as a surgeon? And what are some of the ways in which you use it to optimize outcomes for your patients? Basically, anatomy, surgery is applied anatomy. So um, it's very important in what we do. It helps me to get where I need to go and know what I'm doing. Um, but at the same time, I think as a surgeon, I have to have a lot of respect for anatomy because even though there are some structures that are quite hardy and um, you know if you damage them they'll heal there are certain structures that can't be fixed and that you can't come back from if they're damaged and we just really have to be aware of those things and know where they are and really respect them so that we're not causing harm or damage to our patients when we do surgery. So you do all kinds of surgery, but you have a particular interest in orthopedics and spinal surgery. Could you share with us um, some of the anatomical considerations that apply specifically to that field of surgery? And so like, for example, just some of the key things that you need to be aware of in an applied anatomical context? Um, yeah, um, it, that's a hard question to answer because um, just because there are so many things, um, it's basically everything. Um, one of the main things with neurosurgery and orthopedics is to be aware of the important structures, like I was mentioning before, um, nerves, especially major nerves, the sciatic and radial nerve, those sorts of things that really you can't damage. Otherwise there are major problems. Um, it's also really um, important to be aware of the approaches to bones and joints and where the tissue planes and muscle separations are so that you can safely get to those areas of the body without damaging something that you don't need to damage. Mm -hmm. um, so being really aware of the soft tissues in the area um, is very important. Could you give an example of a surgical approach that can be tricky, for example, with respect to the radial nerve? Um, sure. I mean, the, the main one is the lateral approach to the humerus because the radial nerve is sitting over one of the muscles there, the brachialis. And um, we just, when we do an approach to the humerus, we know that the radial nerve is going to be running directly right over that bone in the middle somewhere. And um, if we're not aware of that, then it, there could be a situation where you might accidentally cut that or traumatize it. Um, but knowing that it's there means that we look out for it and protect it during the surgery. And the sciatic nerve? Uh, sciatic nerve, um, 
that's that's important to be aware of when we're doing surgery around the hip joint um, and down the femur. Um, it's just going there underneath the biceps femoris muscle. Um, so yeah, knowing where that is would be very important if you're doing something like a hip replacement or an FHO um, or fixing a femoral fracture. If we're trying to stabilize a fracture, we have to think about what forces are going to be um, acting on that fracture. Um, even, you know, how much weight is on, on that limb and how much weight is on that fracture um, and how stable the fracture is itself inherently. Like if it's a two piece fracture where they can load share, or if it's a very comminuted fracture that you need to basically support the whole thing with a plate. Um, and I guess um, muscles in that area do come into play in that. Um, in certain areas, especially where you have a fracture with a muscle or ligament attachment, like say if you have a tibial tuberosity avulsion fracture, we need to be aware that you have this great pull coming up there. So we have to counter that um, usually by doing a pin and tension band so that we can convert that Force into a compressive force across the fracture and actually use it to our advantage to help it to heal rather than having it pull it back off again after we've fixed that. And I guess in the example with the cruciate ligament, we yeah, we have to consider, you know, what direction is the cruciate ligament going in and what is it actually doing, like what's its function in the joint. Um, which is preventing that cranial tibial thrust. And then, you know, thinking about that, we then come to what repair options do we have? And we do have quite a lot for the cruciate ligament. Um, one being an osteotomy technique like a TPLO, where we have to really think about um, that tibial plateau angle um, and that anatomy that's already existing there because the purpose of that surgery would be to actually alter or change the anatomy so that we're changing the forces across the joint and neutralizing those cranial tibial thrust forces. Um, so really anatomy comes into every surgery that we're doing. I think my best tip would be to not rush into things and always prepare properly um, because it might not be something that you're doing every day. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to read your approaches and look at the pictures and make sure that you know what you're doing, where you're going, so you don't get lost. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a really great approaches book, which is really super helpful that I still use all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if you're gonna be doing orthopedic surgery in general practice, I would definitely get that book. Um, which one is that? It's uh, Piramati and Johnson's Atlas of Surgical Approaches to the Bones and Joints of Dogs and Cats. I think I had that one back in the day. There must be multiple editions, I think. There, there are a lot of editions, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's really, it has really great pictures um, and it's very helpful for orthopedic approaches in general. Um, another tip would be, I guess, you know, in uni, we don't learn everything there is to know about orthopedic surgery. We actually only get like a tiny snapshot and um, I remember when I was a new grad, I didn't really think about it that way. Like I kind of thought, oh, I've done my degree. I know what I need to know to be a vet and that's it. But you really don't with orthopedics. And so if it's something that people are going to be doing a lot of in GP, I think it would be a great idea to do some continuing education courses mm -hmm. that cover it. I guess what I would always say is that if you don't feel comfortable with doing a certain procedure, um, you should always have the option to refer or always think of it as an option um, to be able to discuss that with the owner. I know that sometimes 
you just can't like if you're not living close to somewhere where there is a referral center or um, if there are financial problems and they just can't do that um, that's always a barrier but I think when we're when we make a decision about whether to refer something or not I always just think like am I the best person to do this for this dog and am I going to get the best outcome for this dog and if the answer is I don't know, or maybe not, then I would say, don't feel like you can't refer it because we're always there. And that's why we're here so that we can help with those complicated cases. That's reminding me to take you all the way back <laughs> to physical examination. Um, so as a specialist, just like as a general practitioner, you would be performing physical examination with a, a patient that comes to see you. So here again, of course, anatomy is is a huge factor. Uh, is there any um, advice from your experience again uh, that you can share on, on how to do that well with orthopedic cases? Let's say not spinal cases necessarily, but say limb uh, lamenesses. Um, yeah, and I guess like everyone has their techniques of how they do it and everyone's a little bit different. Um, but I like to start with just watching the dog walk um, to see what, what its gait is like, which leg is it limping on. It's actually fairly common that someone will come in and say, oh, my dog's lame in the left front leg, but it's actually lame in the right front leg. So uh, to keep that in mind and um really focus on which leg it is firstly um, then I kind of get more focused into which part of the leg is causing the problem um, and usually I would just go like leg by leg um, either in standing if the dog doesn't like to lie down or lying down preferably um, and just flex and extend all the joints just squeeze all the joints and um, check range of motion, check for any abnormal feeling, popping or crepitus or anything like that. Um, and also specifically focusing on the dog's reaction. So noting if the dog is painful and doesn't like it. Um, I guess uh, the most common lamenesses we would see in the hind limb would be related to the stifle. Mm -hmm. So we would uh, really focus in on that, test the cranial draw, tibial thrust, look at the patella, see if that's dislocating. Um, and in the forelimb, it's the elbow, I would say most commonly. Mm -hmm. So um, I would, you know, if I'm thinking about an elbow dysplasia, I would flex and extend, look at the range of motion, um, pronate and supinate as well, because when you do that, you load the medial and lateral compartments differently. Mm -hmm. And that might be more painful than just flexing and extending in itself. Um, and that will really help localize where the problem is. Um, because once we've done that, it's a lot easier to then x-ray the right thing or, or even advanced imaging of the right thing and find what the problem is. Do you have any kind of hacks um, that you use, for want of a better word, for determining, particularly with mild lameness, which leg it is? In the forelimb, it's a bit harder than, it, than the hind limbs. I think hind limbs, it's often quite uh, clear which leg it is. Mm -hmm. But um, in dogs that have a subtle lameness, uh, I would try and run them like because often if they're using the leg more it becomes more painful and then you see that limping a bit better what I did recently when my kelpie had a very mild forelimb lameness and it, exactly the situation you described the forelimb and uh, I ended up using the slow-mo version on my phone camera um, so that I could watch his head bobbing to try to uh, link that with the the limb lameness the, the head bobbing is is really helpful like I guess you know just I just always remember down on sound so the head is down mm -hmm. on like that's not lame mm -hmm. um, if the dog is walking fast it can kind of be a bit hard to see sometimes or if it's really subtle um, 
but yeah, the other thing is like what you said, like watching some videos. Um, I will sometimes get the owners to take some videos and show them to me or send them to me. And then oh. it might become more obvious. Mm -hmm. um, if it's still very subtle, what I'll try and do is um, look at the way that the dog is standing just on a flat surface. And often, even if they have a very mild lameness, the leg that's lame will be slightly offloaded um, such that, you know, if you try and put your finger under the paw pad, they will oh. lift the leg oh. more easily than they would the other ones. Okay. Um, and something else might be getting them to stand on like a, a foam mat or something where you can see the depressions of the feet and then right. notice that one is not as depressed as the others right. and offloading that leg. Wow, that's really interesting. So obviously there are some similarities, but there are clearly also some significant differences between cats and dogs. And I wondered if you could share from your perspective as a surgeon, uh, some examples of that in an applied anatomical context. Um, yeah, so I actually find them overall, like gross anatomy, fairly similar. Um, they have like the same bones, the same joints, like the overall anatomy is quite similar. But um, there are differences in the more subtle details. Um, so one thing that is a bit different from cats um, to dogs is that the bones of cats tend to be a bit of a different shape sometimes, um, not drastically, but um, some of the bones in dogs are quite curved or quite S-shaped. And in general, cat's bones tend to be like a bit straighter, um, which is helpful as a surgeon because we don't then have to do as much contouring of plate, <laughs> things like that. It makes it a bit easier. Um, something that I quite like about the difference between cats and dogs for orthopedics is that the ulna of the cat is a bit thicker than the dog. So when you look at a dog's ulna distally, it becomes really thin, like a little toothpick, um, especially in the tiny dogs. Mm. And cats, it's it's much wider, like it's almost the same size as the radius, but not quite. Um, and that's quite helpful for us in an applied kind of sense, because when we are looking at fixing fractures of these bones, we can often do dual bone fixation. So put something on the radius and the ulna, most of the time plates. Mm. Um, whereas in dogs, we may only be able to fix the radius. And uh, we know from studies that there are higher complication rates in cats with only fixing the radius. So it's quite nice to be able to fix both bones. Mm. And even when thinking about the cat as an animal and what they're gonna do, they pronate and supinate their wrist and their forearms so much more than dogs. It's about 50% more range of motion. So if we can fix both of those bones, we can really get them back to being able to use that leg properly to do the stuff that they want to do, like groom and um, climb, obviously not initially with a fracture, but, you know, do the things that make them happy and increase their quality of life. So that's quite nice. I have a lot of other examples if you want. Oh, <laughs> I just kind of like that one. <laughs> <laughs> if you're happy to give them, that would be fantastic. One is that um, cats actually have an extra muscle um, around the hip joint called the cordofemoralis. And um, when I was a new grad and kind of a bit earlier in my career, I used to get quite confused in that area in cats when I was doing things like FHOs because I didn't realize that they had an extra muscle. So I would get a little bit lost. Um, and I think an FHO is a, a procedure that a lot of GP vets do. So it's quite nice to know that you might see this funny little extra muscle in a cat that mm. that doesn't exist in a dog. Mm. Yes, that's <laughs> definitely a good example. I notice also there are, if I'm seeing correctly, there are cats on your shirt, but no dogs. Yeah. <laughs> I do like cats. 
Thank <laughs> you.